Yo, yo. What up, party people in the place to be? <laughs> My name is Bobito Garcia, aka okay, Cool Bob Love, repping this for a better chance. ABC, a Students of Color scholarship program that provides placements to young people who show promise since the early 1960s, I think 1962 to be exact, was the starting point. In 1982, I had the fantastic opportunity to uh, be tested and recognized as one of the top students academically in the country. And I was sent uh, with the support of a better chance to Lower Marion High School in Ardmore, Pennsylvania, which all of you should know because 12 years later, the late and great legend himself of the NBA and basketball world, Kobe Bryant attended there. But I was there 12 to 14 years before him. And, uh, you know, we were putting the school on the map back then too. Um, so I'm indebted to Lower Marion ABC program for what it presented to me in my life, um, where it took me. And I want to share tonight for the alumni, uh, the creative, creating leaders for a lifetime alumni showcase that a better chance is doing to support them to help raise funds this year with the pandemic it's been rough their uh, annual gala was canceled um so we're just trying to do this virtually thank you for everyone who has already supported and made a donation you can still do that while this q a is going on at the page the event page on the abc site and um, I'm going to encourage you to do that throughout this Q&A. And I really hope that you're feeling what's going on with the, with the questions. Uh, you can also, speaking of questions, there are already some that have been sent. Uh, throughout the next hour, you are more than welcome to utilize the chat to send more questions. And I'll try to get to everybody's question best possible. Uh, I want to particularly thank Gianna. Uh, Joseph and uh, Nicole for reaching out and uh, showing the brother some love. You know, with my film, Rock Rubber 45s, you see the post in the background. It's an autobiographical documentary, which I produced, directed, uh, music supervised, and, and funded um, that was released in 2018. And I could not include my narrative without uh, the presence of my high school years, which, uh, my two at ABC Lower Marion were a big part of. So before I get to the questions and start building on that, I want to recognize some of the sponsors. We want to thank the Bridgewater Associates, Lori and Peter Allen Atkins, the Coasters Family Foundation, Bong Bong, Deloitte, Ooh, DuPont, ha. Theo and Dana, Dana. Killian, Henry R. Kravis, Ronald R. and Mary H. Pressman, Scadden, Ops, Slate, Meager and Flom LLC, as well as Stanley Black and Decker for making this event possible and for securing a better chance for the next generation. All right, people, we're gonna switch to the questions now. Let's see. What what we got here? Do, 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 do. If you just tuned in, my name is Bobby DeGarcia, aka Cool Bob Love. And we are gonna get to some of the questions. Where are they? Yeah, having a good time. If you're having a good time, throw your hands up in the air wherever you at. Ha ha. All right. Gotta get loose. All right. So first question is what inspired you to create this movie about your life? So I am a independent filmmaker and have been one since 2010. My first uh, documentary was titled Doing It in the Park, Pick Up Basketball NYC. Uh, it was a collaboration with the French, uh, up and coming French uh, cinematographer by the name of Kevin Coolio, um, who's since gone on to do Nike ads and Grand Jordan ads and Red Bull and FIBA events um but i was just curious to i had been on camera so much uh 
during the 90s and early 2000s. And I really had uh, just an idea and a lot of a lot of inspiration to get behind the camera, uh, not physically, but in terms of, of directing. And uh, I came up with this idea that uh, no one had ever done a documentary about pickup basketball in New York. How could that be? Uh, how could there never have been a documentary about pickup basketball, period? Um, so because New York is my is my area of expertise, I'm you know, born here in 1966, raised here, uh, and will live and die in the playgrounds uh, of, the, of my beloved sport. Um, we went out and did a, a, a documentary titled Doing the Park, and it wound up winning uh, the award for best uh, feature at the Urban World Film Festival in 2012. It also won the best documentary award at the New Jersey Film Festival. And eventually it was a DIY project. We did a Kickstarter campaign and eventually it uh, got picked up for distribution and you know found itself on PBS. Uh, and also uh, Netflix, um, which was empowering because I, I didn't really know exactly what I was doing. Um, and so that was the first step. The second step was to figure out, well, what's missing in documentaries that I know I'm an expert at. And uh, I came with, with the idea to do a film about me and Stretch's radio show in the 1990s, um, which was the platform to launch the careers of Nas, Biggie, Wu-Tang, Eminem, Jay-Z, uh, Big Pun, Mob Deep. I mean, you know, I didn't really know the metrics at the time, but looking back when I was writing the treatment for the film, it turned out that the unsigned artists and up-and-coming artists that came through our radio program on WKCR 89.9 FM from 90 to 98 had exceeded 300 million record sales in the 25 years that had had passed uh so there was a story there and that was my second film uh showtime picked it up um netflix picked it up and so with those two in my pocket i started getting some confidence and i realized that uh in the space of autobiographical documentaries there wasn't anything that i could find that was hip-hop related or uh the narrative of people of color. Now, I'm not a platinum recording artist. I'm not a former NBA player. Um, I thought up front that perhaps uh, there may be people who would think I, I would be self-aggrandizing uh, with an effort to, to uh, create a story about myself. But the deeper I thought about it, I knew that my existence and what I've been through to get where I've, I am now would be inspiring to people, and it has been. Um, and if you have not watched the film Rock Rubber 45, you see the post in the background. Uh, I encourage you to, even if you didn't catch it today, free streaming on the ABC website. Uh, you can download it, uh, stream it, rent it um, from rockrubber45s.com. And, uh, you know, bingo, I hit a target. Um, because the film came out in 2018. Uh, it didn't get the festival praise um, that my first two films got. It didn't get picked up by Netflix. Uh, it didn't get picked up by PBS or Showtime. Um, so it's been a difficult climb trying to get it to the people, but uh, I wound up doing over 100 screenings worldwide. Um, attended more than half of them myself to do Q and A's and really just you know, targeting uh, my audience, the people who love basketball, which is represented by rock in the title, uh, sneaker culture, which is re represented by rubber in the title, and 45s, which is for records, which you see back here, you know, 45, seven inches, if you don't know, final, um, as well as hip hop. And so what my film and my life has represented was the matrix where basketball, sneakers, and music all kind of like intersect and it's not just my story, but it's a story of like this global movement really um, that I've been so blessed to be a part of. Uh, I've had some amazing experiences um, sharing the film, particularly during the Q&A because there's some 
delicate topics that are cross, uh, particularly uh, being sexually abused as a kid, um, which during uh, the Q and A has brought out uh, the attention of people who have both men and women who have been through the same and uh, felt empowered by the film about how I uh, dealt with it in my adulthood. I don't want to give away the film if you haven't watched it, but, um, but you know, it, it's, it's been a powerful, powerful exchange. I've had people come up to me afterwards and hug me. I've had people, you know, break out in tears. Uh, I've had people write me like, you know, long, long emails the next day saying how the film changed their life. And, and towards that, it's, it was worth everything to create the film Rock Rebel 45s. Uh, how it relates to ABC, there's a scene in the film about how ABC, A Better Chance, is, was transformative for me because uh, as a young teenager growing up in New York, um, you know, I was faced with a lot of uh, quandaries and uh, unsafe zones, you know, between my household, between uh, the parks that I was frequenting to play ball and, you know, the opportunity to leave Brooklyn Tech High School and, uh, and attend Lower Marion High School, which at the time uh, was one of the most well-funded and endowed public schools in the country. Uh, and we were also like, you know, spitting out like merit scholars uh, and, and, and uh, the, the graduation rate was incredible. And, you know, all these things that were not the case for Brooklyn Tech where I was in 1980 through 82. Um, and in fact, uh, while I did okay on all the standardized tests, um, I was uh, recognized as, as a at-risk youth um, because I had failed so many classes at Brooklyn Tech my freshman year and um, essentially, uh, you know, I wasn't aware of the public school program that ABC offered. I was uh, introduced to it by my friend, uh, Dow Roberts, who went to Canterbury. So I thought ABC placed students of color in boarding schools and uh, private day schools in your, in your hometown. Um, I wasn't aware that they had this public school program, which was kind of like a a mix between a boarding school and a public school. So I lived in a house uh, about two miles away from Lower Marion High School with nine other ABC students. We were uh, there with two resident guardians, one resident tutor. Um, and, uh, you know, and we bonded very closely. Uh, and Ahmad Hooper, who became my best friend, uh, out of that experience and is still one of my best friends to this day. I'm age 54 now. Uh, I graduated from uh, Lower Marion, what, uh, 36 years ago? <laughs> kind of crazy, right? Um, but, you know, our friendship has endured all these years. And um, so, you know, it's impossible to fit 50 years of one's life into a film but uh, it was imperative that I um, included my ABC experience in Rock and Roll 45s. Um, and, you know, it didn't hurt that I had the celebrity injection of meeting Patti LaBelle through the program, you know, who was my host parent. Uh, and I, one, uh, one Sunday a month, I would spend time with her and her husband at the time, Armstead Edwards, her son, Yuri. Um, and her other two children who were adopted. Uh, and, you know, they would cook for me. They would take me to the movies or, you know, sometimes we would just hang out at the house and just do nothing and and just, you know, have some downtime. But it was a very supportive environment. She was on the road a lot, so I didn't get to see her every single month. But, um, you know, I was very fortunate to get, get her to uh, get on camera for the film. Um, and, uh, you know, what she shared was just awesome, you know, like, wow, like Patti LaBelle, <laughs> you know. Um, shout out to my man, Dak Tirado, watching the, uh, the stream right now. Another former uh, ABC student and, uh, you know, dear friend from my block, 97th Street. Um, 
So anyway, uh, back to Patty LaBelle, you know, I was very happy to get her in the film uh, to talk about, you know, how we met and how she, you know, nurtured my spirit as a 16, 17 year old, uh, not even realizing, that, you know, the pop icon, icon that she was at the time. I didn't realize how big Patty LaBelle was until after I graduated. There was an event called Live Aid, and which was a huge fundraiser and an outdoor concert. And they performed We Are the World, which Patty LaBelle was on. And here you have like 30 of the world's most famous singers. I'm talking about Bono from U2, Sting, Tina Turner, uh, Annie Lennox. I mean, you know, you name it, like the biggest, biggest names in music, pop, rock, hip hop, you name it, were all on that stage. And Patti LaBelle got on the mic and Cole ripped it. I mean, she called S-H-I-T on everybody. Like nobody wanted to get on the mic afterwards. And I was like, oh snap, that was my host parent at ABC, what? Um, I want to include that in Rockable 45s, but didn't make it. Um, all right, let me uh, make sure that I'm seeing what y'all are saying, private chat. Let's see the comments. Or, okay. Hey, Gianna, what's happening? And uh, shout out to Kittus, Mellis. Now let's get to the next question. Bung, 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 bung. Uh, where we at? Boom. So I could talk. Have you realized that? Uh, if you just tuned in, this is the ABC uh, fundraiser. Um, this is part of the alumni alumni sh uh, showcase. My name is Bobito Garcia, aka Cool Bob Love, Lower Marion High School graduate, 1984 of the ABC program. I'm very proud of that fact. Um, all right, second question: What is your all-time favorite sneaker and why? I get asked this question a lot. Um, there's actually a scene in my film, Rock Rebel 45s, and um, where I answer the question because it's not what people expect. Uh, I think most people uh, see me as a collector, which I'm, I never have been. Um, I have lent some of my sneakers to various cultural institutions and museums. Uh, for the sake of academia and uh, learning. Um, I authored a book, Where'd You Get Those? New York City Sneaker Culture, 1960 to 1987. Um, that's talked about in my film, Rockable 45s. Uh, I also um, hosted the first uh, television, television series um, covering sneaker culture titled It's the Shoes for ESPN. Uh, 2019, I directed a series titled uh, sneaker Center for ESPN Plus, their streaming service. Uh, so I, I, I've been deep into the culture and I've done a lot for it. Um, however, I think what's most dear to me is that uh, I've been able to support various nonprofits with donations and and with advocacy. So one in particular, Who's for Hope, uh, was um, doing a lot of work in South Africa and Zimbabwe and I uh, covered them in my first uh, magazine uh, that I was editor-in-chief of called Bounce from the Playground. And, uh, you know, that was uh, helpful to raise awareness for what they were doing in terms of reaching out to young people uh, and providing them with not only uh, basketball teaching and coaching, but life skills and HIV prevention, which was a, a huge problem in the continent. Um, the second thing I did for them was feature them on It's the Shoes on ESPN Network, which uh, brought them to a national audience. And uh, by virtue of that, uh, they want to bring in a lot of money. Um, they uh, were able to erect a court in Harare, Zimbabwe, and they dedicated it in my name. And again, this is this is a, a scene in my film, Rock Rebel 45. So, uh, you know, I finally got to go down there to, to visit and, um, and and teach a clinic. Um, and one of the coaches had a pair of sneakers on that, that I had actually donated five, six years prior, um, which blew my mind, blew my mind. Those are my favorite sneakers. And that's why. And 
you know, I would much uh, rather you watch Rock Rubber 45s and get to that scene because it's way more powerful uh, uh, and impactful if you watch and see the footage of me in Zimbabwe with the children uh, on the basketball court. Um, and, you know, just one of the most beautiful experiences of my life, really. Uh, so I think when people ask me, like, what's my favorite sneaker, they expect me to say, oh, you know, the Air Force One or, you know, the you know, the, the Adidas, you know, that I designed or whatever, whatever, but now nah, it's a pair of sneakers that I donated. I, all right, so we're 22 minutes in. Let's get to the next question. How did you collaborate? Well, I see there's a lot of sneaker heads out there. Uh, oh, let's see. I think there's another question that's coming in. Here. Do you have a favorite court to play on? What are some cities that you that have great courts that surprised you? Okay, um, so I'm gonna get to that question. Well, my favorite court to play on is surprise, surprise, the very for, first um, parks and recreation playground that I ever played on. Um, my first jump shot was taken in the backyard of 120 West 97th Street between Columbus, Columbus and Amsterdam. Uh, it was a private court, um, only for residents of the building. Um, and the room was like like 11 feet high. It was wow, wow, dumb high. <laughs> like nobody ever dunked on that court. Uh, it was a wood backboard, you know, like crazy homemade DIY. Um, there was no lines for the foul line or nothing like that. But uh, the first time I ever played ball in an official like New York City outdoor court, was at PS163 Playground in 1977. I was 11 years old. Reginald Brignoli, uh, my classmate from Holy Name, thank you. Um, I don't know where you're at in your life these days, but uh, much love because he was the one on a lunch break that was like, yo, Bob, let's go, let's go over to, to you know, PS163. Now, at the time, I didn't know this, the court was known to the basketball community as the GOAT, uh, G-O-A-T, named after playground legend Earl Manigault, uh, who in the early 1960s uh, broke the New York City Junior High School scoring record with like a 54-point performance. Uh, he then led Benjamin Franklin High School to the city championship. Um, they didn't win, but they played at Madison Square Garden. And Earl Manigault at that time was you know, destroying people on every single playground in Harlem and the Upper West Side, alongside Lou Alcinda, who later on became the NBA's all-time leading scorer, a record that still holds to this day. Not Michael Jordan, not Kobe Bryant, not uh, LeBron James have still touched Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's record. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar once said that Earl Manigault was the best guard he had ever seen play out of New York. Now, unfortunately, Earl uh, fell to a drug addiction, um, wound up getting incarcerated, and never realized his potential as a pro player. Um, that said, he dedicated his life to teaching the youth, and he actually mentored me as a child. Um, starting at 81, uh, I would, used to go to GOAT um, on 99th and Amsterdam, it's still there. And uh, Earl was still dunking in, in his mid thirties after having been having operations and you know, uh, you know the heroin addiction. It was incredible to see him play, uh, and he loved my game. And and I loved his spirit and his presence and his leadership, which was quiet, very quiet. It was, didn't say many, many words, but the nod was all you kind of needed. And I speak about this extensively in Rock Rubber Forty Fives. Um, but uh, so that's my favorite court to play on. And, and uh, in 2013, I started a tournament uh, called Full Court 21, uh, the world and the sports first ever organized presentation of one on five basketball, meaning whoever has the ball is on offense. Everybody else on the court is on defense. No teammates, no, no uh, coaches, uh, no subs. It's, you know, you against the world. And in 2016, I moved the tournament to the GOAT 
uh, to pay homage to my mentor and to the legend, but also to continue the legacy of uh, global attention on 99th and Amsterdam, which is where I grew up. I don't, I, I live in Brooklyn now, but uh, you know, I, I, I wanna continue the the energy that has always existed in that playground since the early 70s when the when the court was first built. Uh, you can go to fullcourt21nyc.com to learn more about the tournament. I didn't do it this summer um, due to uh, the pandemic, uh, but hoping to return in 2021. Inshallah, or ojalá in Espanol. Um, second question is, what are some cities that I've been shocked about basketball um, and that, that surprised me uh, while while touring the film, doing it in the park, pick up basketball NYC. Kevin Coolio, my collaborator and I, we uh, went to some amazing, amazing places. But the one that blew me away by far, leaps and bounds, was Manila in the Philippines. I would say that that is the mecca for outdoor basketball worldwide. I mean, you know, kids were playing barefooted and flip flops in the middle of the street with traffic. I mean, cars heading towards them while they're playing. Um, and a lot of makeshift courts because the love is so strong out there uh you know they just there's no limit there's no limit um so props to uh the philippines for being so uh die hard about the sport that i love so much um but that said i mean you know new york is still the mecca everybody wants to play at west fourth and, and the rucka and uh you know i'm very proud to have not only documented the sport here but also be a an active player still to this day at age 54, even through the pandemic, uh, I still play almost every single day, weather permitting. So um, yeah, man. All right. Uh, let's see, what do you think of the relationship between hip hop and poetry and how they interact and play off of each other? Well, I mean, uh, in the film, Rock Rubble 45, you'll see a scene about the New York and Poets Cafe and my role in helping merge hip hop to spoken word, um, which uh, started in the 90s. Um, prior, there were sort of like two separate camps. There was a spoken word camp that was very strong. There was some slams uh, that um, were going on in various cities around the world. Um, but the infusion of hip hop, jazz, and spoken word at the events that we used to do at the New York New Post Cafe, which actually prior to New York, we actually started it at uh, the the uh, the Blue Note um, on Bleecker Street, and was the Blue Note. I'm, bu I'm bugging right now. Uh, was it the Blue Note? I gotta look it up. It was an old jazz club that's no longer there, unfortunately. Uh, but we used to perform on the same stage that Thelonious Monk used to play his piano. In fact, Monk's piano was still on, on stage when I was hosting the, the, uh, the Village Gate. I'm sorry, the Village Gate, not, not the Blue Note. Uh, we started the, the hip hop, poetry, jazz events at the Village Gate in, I think, 92 or 93. The gate closed, and then we moved it to New York and Post Cafe. Um, and there, that's when the explosion started. Uh, and spoken word artists who were of the generation of hip hop, highly influenced by hip hop, some were MCs and experimenting with spoken word. Uh, you know, and it, it all just started to like just mesh. Um, eventually, Death Poetry Jam came out, which was heavily influenced and, in fact, modeled after. Uh, our events, shout out to Rocky LaMontagne, the producer of uh, the All That event uh, at the New York Weekend. And shout out to Charlotte, who's the unheralded uh, co-founder of the All That Showcase, which originally was called Bebop uh, for some minute and significant details about the event. And that 
showcase is still going on to this day. I left it uh, in the late nineties uh, to move on to, to other uh, interests and efforts and endeavors. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, my time on the mic, uh, introducing the world, the first time Lemon Anderson ever performed was on my stage. Uh, he went on to be a Tony Award winner uh, with Deaf Poetry Jam. Um, he's performed the Nike commercials. Uh, I mean, you know, he's written scripts. Uh, he had a, a long running show at the uh, at the public theater. Um, Saul Williams, the first time he ever performed, uh, was on my stage at the New Year weekend. And, um, you know, he wound up uh, starring in the film Slam, which was highly uh, influential for spoken word wor worldwide. In fact, he wound up moving to France and releasing an album out there because of the, the film's popularity in that country. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, how has hip hop been influenced by poetry? I mean, hip hop is poetry, right? Um, spoken word, however, is not all hip hop. There's a lot of spoken word that has nothing to do with hip hop. Uh, and spoken word predates hip hop. So, um, you know, they have an interesting relationship. And, uh, you know, I, I like to see people speaking their mind and expressing themselves. And in each case, uh, it has provided a platform, particularly for people of color, uh, which, you know, still to this day are a not fully voiced community. We see what's happening in current events. Uh, and, you know, the uh, explosion of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is still, you know, struggling, struggling, um, you know, to be heard. I mean, Breonna Tur Taylor is not fully heard, you know. I mean, if, if our society cannot convict people who have murdered innocent Black people, then their voices are not being heard. So uh, salute to the spoken word community that is speaking out. Uh, power to the hip hop community who is speaking out. Um, I saw an incredible uh, uh, post by, by Black Thought and Maida Del Valle uh, recently about 45 lives. Check out the, uh, the, the hashtag on Instagram. But uh, all right, wow, I'm running out of time. So let me go to the next question. And if you just tuned in, my name is Bobito Garcia, aka Cool Bob Love. This is uh, uh, alumni uh, showcase for a better chance to help raise funds for the nonprofit organization that has been supporting students of color since the early 1960s. That's older than me. I'm born in 1966. Um, all right, so the question now is, how did your collaboration with Nike and Puma happen? Well, uh, the Nike collaboration happened because, um, well, I mean, let's be real. Uh, I had been consulting Nike since 1993, as well as Wyden and Kennedy. And uh, there was talks of me collaborating with them back in, back in like 98, 99. Uh, and it just never happened. Um, and then one of their uh, design and marketing uh, directors had asked me to, if, if I could have the shoe of my dream, what would it be? And I told him uh, uh, Air Force One with a uh, with, uh, burgundy suede and a gum bottom. Uh, three years later, they wound up handing that to me um, as a one of one, um, but still no collab. And then the era of collabs started happening. And it was like weird. Like everyone who was doing a collab, Stash, De La Soul was coming to me like, yo, what do you think? Oh, word, like, yo, you like them? Like, and so uh, I had to like kind of bark at Nike and be like, look, you know, everyone you're doing collabs with is looking for, for my approval. And you've been talking to me about doing a collab for like seven, eight years. Like, what's up? And so Fraser Cook, was re who was uh, a legend in London in the sneaker world, uh, was working at the swoosh at the time and he made it happen. I wound up doing seven sneakers for the Nike Air Force One 25th anniversary. Um, to this day, I don't know anyone who has collaborated and done that many uh, colors of one model in one year. 
Uh, it was a big deal. Uh, and they are uh, still selling to this day. I mean, they sold out, but I mean, secondhand, you know, uh, I've seen them on eBay for like $600 or whatever, uh, which is cool, which is great. Uh, the collab with Puma happened because I've done a number of collabs, including Proked, Adidas, uh, Piola, um, K1X, uh, and Nike. And in 2015, Puma approached me about uh, being involved uh, with the Puma Clyde, which was like, whoa, the iconic Puma Clyde, you serious? So uh, I rocked that for them. And uh, that shoe came out, did very well. Uh, did so well, in fact, that they asked me to return and do a collaboration with them for the 50th anniversary of the Puma Suede, uh, which got uh, released in 2018. Um, so props to Puma, props to Nike, props to Adidas, Prokeds, K1X, Piola, um, all the brands that have given me like just the, the dream opportunity to you know, decide on colors and fabrics and logos and and uh, box design. You know, it's it's been uh, just a surreal experience for someone who you know. And all this didn't make my film. This is something that I wanted to be included in Rock Rover Forty Fives. But again, like you do a ninety minute film on you know fifty years of someone's life, it's impossible to fit everything in. So, uh, thank you for that question. Um, all right, let's get to the next question. Da. So the next question is, what was it being? What was it like being in NBA Street Volume Two? All right, well, uh, that was kind of exhausting. Uh, for those who don't know, EA Sports was uh, producing video games for basketball and decided to take a, a curveball and create NBA Street, um, which did very well for them. Uh, but for volume two, they wanted something more authentic and more New York. So they approached me and flew me out to Vancouver. <laughs> and uh, it turned out that the script was written by a bunch of hockey players, you know, uh, which is the most popular sport in Canada. So no surprise, uh, not to say basketball fever isn't strong, you know, Toronto Raptors just won last year, but we're talking about 2003. Uh, so I told him, I said, look, I'll do the script, but you gotta let me ad lib and you gotta let me improvise and you gotta let me create my own lines. And they were like, yes, please, please. So they had me up there for five days, eight hours a day, screaming at the top of my lungs. That's like a pizza with no slice. Uh, you know, just saying, hey, don't get and, uh, you know, and it was a lot of fun, uh, paid very well. And they were so happy with my performance that they asked me to uh, do the national um, TV spot, um, which made a lot of uh, noise because that, that that was the one where I was on top of a rooftop saying, street ball will never be the same. And, uh, you know, you can find that on YouTube. Um, that's another thing that didn't make Rock Rubble 45s. Again, you know, just impossible to fit everything in my life in the film. Uh, but, you know, an experience I was very proud of. Uh, I also did Volume 3, and then I, um, EA Sports did it, went a different direction for Volume 4. But I wound up appearing in NBA 2K8, 2K9, and 2K10 as the announcer for the dunk contest. Uh, now, funny story. Uh, I had never played video games uh, prior to doing the EA Sports ones and really haven't played them since. I played NBA Street Volume 2 once against a 13-year-old who spanked me. <laughs> uh, but ultimately, you know, people should know that I'm not really a spectator. I didn't watch any games in the NBA Finals, haven't in years. Um, I'm a ball player first before I'm a spectator. I love to see great basketball played, don't get me wrong, but uh, I have a lot on my plate and I have a child and, you know, he's my priority. And so, yeah, I will get back to watching basketball as a pastime down the road. But if I only have an hour and a day, I'm going out to the park and putting up jumpers. You know, that's that's my safe space. That's my therapy. 
You know, that's my activity. That's my exercise. I'm 54 years old. You know, during the pandemic, I'm proud to say that I've uh, become in better shape than I have been in a long time. I'm at, I'm actually at the same weight that I was when I was playing at Lower Marion High School. Uh, since March 11th, I've been plant-based, uh, jumping rope, playing ball. So, you know, um, I'm thankful for the blessings. And I know I'm going off topic, but uh, in any event, we uh, can go to the next question. Who is out there? If you're in the chat rooms, holla, man. I want to know. I want to know you enjoying this. You know, hopefully, you are listening and and uh, and getting something out of this. I'm speaking, speaking from my heart here. You know. Um, all right. <laughs> the question is: At the end of Rock Rebel 45, you mentioned your son. Is he a ball player? Uh <laughs> My son is six years old right now. He's going to turn seven soon. And he likes basketball, um, but he's six, you know, and I have no intention of uh, forcing him to do drills or, you know, encouraging him to uh, learn the game. I am fully fulfilled as a ball player. I'm not trying to, you know, um, relive my career through my son. Uh, if he ever catches the fever, I will fully facilitate and support that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's up to him. He loves drawing. He loves graffiti. Uh, he takes graffiti classes. Um, he loves riding his bicycle. Um, he loves to run. Uh, he loves math and writing and, you know, and reading. You know, he's read over 500 books since the pandemic started. Literally, I'm not even joking. So, uh, you know, wherever his interests take him, you know, his mother and I, we foster him with self-directed learning as a as a um, a premise. And, you know, we just facilitate. So uh, would I love to see him fall in love with basketball? Sure. But, um, you know, it's fine if he doesn't. It's fine. As long as he doesn't fall in love with soccer, I think I'm all right. <laughs> all right. Shout out to Jose Garcia. Uh, the question from him, is there anything you want to create that you haven't created yet? Well, that's a great question. Um, I have a bunch on the horizon, Jose. Um, and, you know, ultimately, you know, on the, on the life uh, bucket list, I think I've already checked off everything. Um, but, you know, we live in an interesting time. And, you know, where my interest will uh, roll to, I don't know. Um, Stretch, my former radio partner, uh, is a, once again my radio partner. We're about to debut a new radio show on October 22nd. Uh, I can't quite yet say the platform, but it, it is huge and available worldwide. Um, and uh, you, su you can subscribe to it. So uh, please follow at Stretch and Bobito on Instagram, or just follow at Cool Bob Love. That's with a K um, for information. But the broadcast uh, debut will be Thursday, October twenty second, from ten p.m. to midnight uh, Eastern Standard Time, and we will have our radio show every two weeks for the next six months. And if it does well, uh, we'll continue. Uh, Stretch and I also have a podcast on the horizon. Uh, with a platform that I can't mention just yet. Uh, Stretch and I also, um, this was on the bucket list for a long time, was uh, we have a band called the M19s and we produced an album uh, titled No Request, which debuted in January of this year. Uh, we were set to go on tour. We did our debut concert at the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC, our country's official cultural center. Um, and the pandemic hit, so that was unfortunate. Um, but we're moving forward and we're about to release some new music. Uh, and I can tell you what we have done. We've taken freestyles from our radio show uh, with Big L, Jay-Z, um, Biggie, uh, Nas, Method Man, Ghostface, uh, Mob Deep, on and on. And we have remixed them. We have remixed the acapellas of those freestyles with technology that wasn't available until this year, 2020 and uh, laid down new instrumentals with our band, the M19s, and that's dropping October 23rd. So a lot, a lot, a lot of activity on the horizon. 
uh, and I hope that you participate and enjoy all of it. Um, I also have a Patreon page that you can subscribe to uh, for $5 a month, um, patreon.com slash coolboblove. And, um, you know, there I'm posting exclusive content, you know, video, uh, DJ mixes, photos, and uh, that I'm not posting anywhere else. So those are all the things that I, I, I look to continue to develop and grow. Um, but as far as what I haven't created yet, I don't know. I don't know. Ask me that question again in five years. All right. Um, the next question. Oh, and we are running out of time. That is incredible. Uh, do you miss having a store? Running a successful storefront in NYC is an amazing accomplishment, but also notoriously difficult. Would you try again? <sighs> okay. Well, you are hitting a lot of pinpoints that I can't talk about, but Stretch and I are on the precipice of um, developing a concept for a shop, um, which I can't talk about yet. So um, would I open up another sneaker store? No, I wouldn't do that. I already did that. Uh, if you want information about my shop, Bobito's Footwork, which was opened up in New York, as well as Philadelphia. Shout out to Rich Medina, my partner down there. Um, watch my film, Rock Rebel 45s. Uh, you can look up Bobito's footwork uh, on Google and you will find that complex.com uh, has uh, featured it in numerous articles. In one, uh, the number one sneaker store uh, or number one hip hop store, shop, uh, boutique of all time. In one article that was years ago, um, yeah, I mean, it was a shop that came before its time and, uh, you know, a lot of people recognize it as the first sneaker boutique, uh, as we know boutiques, as we, as we view them today. Um, and I was just too early and that's fine. But, uh, but yeah, lost a lot of money doing that. Won't do it again. <laughs> Moving on to other things. All right. Um, next question. How did not knowing Spanish growing up affect your understanding and placement in, in Puerto Rican culture? Well, um, not knowing Spanish growing up uh, did at times make me feel less Boricua than I might have otherwise because I was constantly reminded by. Spanish speakers, oh, tú eres no, tú no eres boricua, si tú no hablas español. Um, you know, like if you don't speak Spanish, then you're not Puerto Rican, and and hurtful comments like that. Um, and you know, instead of uh, trying to welcome me or invite me to learn, uh, I felt kind of like outcast. And uh, you know, so in my 40s, I decided to not blame anyone else but myself. You know, and I took it upon myself to to learn the language in the last 14 years has strengthened uh, my vocabulary and my ability to, to converse. I'm still not fluent completely, but I can have, you know, moderate conversations, can order food and ask for, uh, you know, to give a taxi driver directions. I've done interviews live on, on national TV in Puerto Rico, <laughs> which was nerve wracking, but, um, you know, I've gotten by and uh, very proud of that, and have become sort of a beacon of inspiration for other Boricuas and uh, people of you know various nationalities who have adopted uh, Spanish as a language that they want to learn in their in their adulthood, and uh, it's been nice to to share with them, um, you know, the ways that I was able to to learn. Um, but ultimately, I mean, you know, me, uh, really advocating, I mean, you see my t-shirt, it says Free Puerto Rico, uh, soy un, un independentista, uh, I believe in the sovereign right of my island to be self-governed and to, term, to determine their taxes and foreign policy and their, uh, relationships with other, uh, uh, surrounding islands and countries and and all that uh and you know i would love to see 
my people there have become more self-sufficient. Uh, clearly, we cannot depend on the United States uh, to um, solve all of our problems uh, because the government here has their own self-interest in our island's position for the military um, and uh, the economic um, uh, like paradise that it is, you know, in terms of uh, corporate benefits that have been given to uh, brands that have opened up factories there uh, giving, and been given tax breaks. You see a lot of uh, Bitcoin uh, millionaires moving down there for the tax breaks. And so uh, there's a lot of money that could be generated on the island that would benefit the island. Um, you know, you see the Jones Act, which prevents uh, the, the people there uh, from growing their own food. I mean, I think like 75% of the food eaten on the island is even grown on the island. Meanwhile, we have fertile land, even though it's been destroyed by, you know, corporate greed down there, pollution, whatever. It's a long, long, long story. I can go on about that for a long time. We run out of time, but, uh, yeah, man, I love my people. Okay. Do you have any words of advice for young? young children of color who want to pursue their passion in the creative industries as you have? Uh, yes, I would say first and foremost, um, watch my film. Like literally it was when I was writing the script and treatment for it, uh, you know, it was in my mind to provide a blueprint for other freelance creatives to see what it's like um to have an idea uh transform it into a business and then actually succeed at that at that endeavor because it's one thing to be creative it's another thing to have the savvy know-how on how to monetize your ideas um and that's difficult it's a lot it's something that a lot of people uh, have not figured out um some people are very creative and other people figure it out for them um, and some people are very creative and partner with people who figure it out how, how to make money from their ideas. Um, but the ultimate is when you can do it yourself. Uh, it's self-empowering. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm blessed that I've been able to do so many different, uh, Uh, projects in basketball, music, and sneakers, you know, and, you know, hit it on the nose in each one. And this on a lot too, you know, if you see my film uh, and the narrative, you know, so I made a lot of mistakes and that's, that's how you, learning from mistakes is a wonderful thing. And that's what I would impart on young people. There's no replacement for hard work um, and all the keys to being a freelance creative are all in my film. So watch it two times, three times, and learn. All right. What's a piece of advice you can give to creators? I think I just answered that in the last uh, answer. So how hard is it as an independent filmmaker to get a film off the ground? Wow. Um, if there are any filmmakers in this uh, meeting, feel more than welcome to email me at coolboblove, I'm sorry, info at coolboblove.com. And uh, that's um, cool with a K. Uh, or you could DM me on Instagram, coolboblove, K-O-O-L-B-O-B-L-O-V-E, -O -O -B -B -E, uh, Facebook as well. Um, and uh, I can share links with you. Uh, I also do independent um, consulting uh, for $25 per 10 minutes and happy to do a Zoom. Um, and I have done this with other film, up and coming filmmakers to help people figure out how to navigate that space. Uh, there are phenomenal websites like uh, nofilmschool.com that are very helpful. Um, uh, um, uh, Sundance has a wonderful website 
that's very helpful to up and coming filmmakers. Um, so there's a lot of information out there. You're, you're in a, in a good, good space because, uh, you know, information is not hard to find anymore. Um, still doesn't replace research and, and effort and hard work, but it could, it, it's out there for you to find and I can help you figure it out if needed. All right. Um, so large gatherings are on hold. How do you see DJs, DJs adapting? Um, uh, we have been adapting by doing uh, virtual DJ sets. Uh, myself and DJ Stretch uh, have been doing uh, shows every week on IG Live at 10 p.m. Uh, we're going to move our mix show to another platform starting October 22nd. I can't announce the platform just yet, but it's right around the corner. Uh, follow me at Cool Bob Love with a K on Instagram for the announcement. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I miss DJing in front of a crowd. I mean, there's nothing like that. You know, just hearing the you know the booming sound system and seeing people dance and sweating and you know coming up to yo, what record is that? And you know, it's just like an energy that it becomes like the spiritual like uh combination between the 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 tone of the music and and the dance floor and you know it's just wonderful uh but we'll get back to that you know i'm hopeful trying to stay positive through this pandemic that uh we will get back to you know being together in the same rooms and without distancing without masks in time we need to be patient for that though so that we get there health in a healthy manner uh, my man Dak Torado is asking me to ever show any of my photos at galleries. Um, I have had my images um, included in a number of exhibitions. Um, uh, I've had my cassettes uh, at the uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, I've had my sneakers and photos at the Museum of the City of New York. In fact, right now, there's an exhibition called City Game. Um, and I lent uh, two of my sneakers, um, as well as about like nine or 10 of my photos uh, to the exhibition. And they're also, my photos are also in the accompanying book uh, titled City Game, which was released by Rizzoli uh, Publishers Publishing. Um, I, I actually wrote a, 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 a chapter for the Rizzoli book as well, title City Game. So, um, but um, I, you know, I'm not a professional photographer. Um, so uh, when my photos are requested, I'm happy to share them, um, but I haven't really necessarily peddled my photos at galleries. Uh, maybe one day, who knows? All right, I think it's eight o'clock people. Uh, let me look at the, uh, way to let's see all right let's close this and so i want to thank everyone who submitted questions for the q a uh and for tuning into the second session i'm sorry the last session of creating leaders for a lifetime alumni show alumni alum aluminum alum Alumni Showcase, uh, creative, Creating Leaders for a Lifetime was created to address the lost revenue from the A Better Chance Annual Awards Luncheon. Um, below me, you'll find an online donation form. Uh, I encourage you to provide whatever you can. It could be a dollar, could be $5, it could be a lot more than that. Uh, and to support the nonprofit organization, I'm grateful for what ABC uh, did for my life. It's transformative. I know that it's done the same for thousands of students of color dating back to the 1960s. And I um, just want to say thank you, everybody. Thank you to ABC. Thank you to Lil Marion. Uh, shout out to Bob, my resident tutor who passed away um, in 1985, a year after I graduated from Lil Marion. I want to thank uh, Charlotte Hunter, who was my resident tutor at Lower Marion my senior year. 
magically, she was a Wesleyan student taking a year off. And that heavily affected my decision to apply to Wesleyan. Uh, and the fact that I actually got in was a blessing. Another uh, school that transformed my life. Um, and I just got nothing but gratitude. So uh, shout out to ABC, yo. Rock, rock on, yo. Peace.